I am Sunita and I am the verbal head at GMAT Wiz. I'm going to be your host for this session. Uh, I have been in this prep industry for almost a decade now. And I got into this industry because teaching was a passion with me. And gradually I started teaching for various entrance exams. And of course, now I am into all into GMAT. So um, because teaching is a passion for me, you will find that the way I teach is very different from how anybody else would teach. All right. It's less to do with, you know, uh, just solving questions. Today, we're not just going to solve questions, guys. We're going to look at how to solve those questions. So today's session is not just about how many questions you're going to solve. The entire session is about what are you going to learn from the session, guys. All right. So let me just wish uh, all of you a quick hello. Uh, so we've already, I've already wished Carlos, Annie and Daniel. Hi, Tarang. Hello, Subhu. Hi, Tolu from Nigeria. Subhu is from Nepal. Hi, NG. NG is from Vietnam. Very nice. So this is good. I mean, we've got so many countries right now. Guys, what about the others? I can see that there are almost 80 of you out there. Come on, a little more hello would get me going strong, guys. Hi, Haman. Very nice. So these are some very unusual names too. All right, guys, how many of y'all are really troubled by CR? When it comes to CR, you find yourself in a, uh, you know, in a spot. Hi, Simone. Hi, Ankita. Hello, Nikhila. Nikhila is from Bangalore. Hi, Hitakshi. Hello, Vibhor. Hi, Hitakshi. Yes, nice to see you again, Hitakshi. Hi, Julia. Nice to see you again. Hello, Kushbu. Hi, Ankit. Some of you uh, have been in this journey with me for quite some time now so you're like family uh yes guys so my question was how many of y'all find yourself in a spot when it comes to cr hi ravi is from kolkata so ravi i am also currently in kolkata so we are neighbors in that sense hi asitima hi isha hi puja hello lucifer lucifer is also from kolkata uh so Daniel says, good Lord, I, I need this. Hi, Rajavi. Nice to see you again. So, so guys, today, again, let me repeat quickly. Let me take you over the agenda today. What are we going to learn today? The agenda of today's session is to learn three very powerful strategies that you need to solve almost every CR question. The first one is what we call power of analyzing the stimulus correctly. All right, let me emphasize the word correctly because I'm sure everybody reads the stimulus before solving the CR question, but a lot of you don't read it correctly. As a result of that, when you are eliminating answer choices, you go wrong. So just hold on to that. This is really going to uh, take you by surprise, okay? Analyzing, the power of analyzing the stimulus correctly. Second, the power of defining the scope of the argument. Yes, guys, you heard that right. Uh, very often you rule out an answer choice saying this is out of scope. But do you ever really take the trouble to define the scope of an argument? Probably not. Today we are going to see how being able to define the scope will help you eliminate the incorrect options with confidence and choose the correct answer. Finally, we are going to talk about power of applying frameworks, all right, for solving, uh, for pre thinking. So I'm sure a lot of you. Uh, everybody knows what pre-thinking is, but probably no one has really ever applied frameworks, you know, uh, pre-prepared, uh, pre let's say, formulas um, that would help you pre-think on certain questions. So that's the agenda of today, guys, and I'm going to take it one by one. We're going to build up, all right? We're going to build up from how to analyze the stimulus correctly. Uh, then how to define the scope of the argument and then we are going to apply a couple of frameworks on different questions all excited guys are you excited if you are excited this is going to be a wonderful journey and i do hope you are okay again let me stress the point is to learn these strategies i'm going to use some simple examples at times i'm going to use some complicated uh, questions at times, but the idea will be for each of you to understand 
how you can improve your CR solving skills by applying these three powerful strategies. Okay. All right. Great. So I can see all of you are really looking forward to this. Let me get started without any more ado. So first we're going to take up the power of analyzing the stimulus correctly. Okay. Here's the question, guys. Without any more, uh, uh, let me say, uh, uh, you know, without any more wasting of time, let me get you to solve this question straight away. This is a GMAT with in-house question, guys. And I want you guys to spend about, I'll give you two minutes to solve this question, post which I'm going to show you some things, okay? Here, I'm going to mute myself and bring up the polls. So here goes, your time starts now. And currently, I want each of you to solve it the way you normally solve a CR question. Then we are going to see what difference uh, a proper analysis of the stimulus makes to such questions. It's our up. <clears throat> so I'm just going to do a quick countdown while you guys uh, uh, kind of put in your polls if you haven't done that already. So here goes my countdown. I'll count five, five, four, three, two, and one. All right, guys. So please put in your polls quickly. Subu says it's a difficult question. It's a tough question. Don't worry, Subu. Today we are going to decode a lot of things for everybody. So Amar Preet, um, I've got your answer. Uh, you can mark it in the polls also. So I'm going to end the polls, guys. <clears throat> Five, <clears throat> four, three, two, and one. Okay. 18% of you believe the correct answer is A, 18, 41%, that's the majority, believe the correct answer is B. None of you have gone for C, 18% believe it's D, and 20% believe it's E. Guys, let me tell you, a lot of you are wrong. Okay, guys, before I delve into answering this question, all right? How many of y'all found it challenging? How many of y'all found it challenging? If you found it challenging, mark a yes. If you found it easy, mark no. There's a reason why I'm asking this question. While you're putting in that poll, I want you guys to tell me in the chat box, what is the conclusion of this uh, argument, okay? What is the conclusion of this argument? So I can see 75%, in fact, almost 80% of you found this question challenging. And about 20% of you did not find it challenging. All right. And now I want you guys, uh, those who believe it's challenging and also those who believe it's not challenging, to kind of see whether you got this question right or not, or not, number one. You know, sometimes what appears very simple to us is not so simple. Deceptively, uh, it's deceptive. So we're going to watch out. I want you guys to watch out for that. So yes, I want you to tell me what is the conclusion of this argument. Simone is saying that the statement starting with if is the conclusion. Mahima says, uh, the first conclude the first statement government efforts were successful is the conclusion all right ps says the first statement is the conclusion tushar says first um garima says the first one is a conclusion ng says the first one is a conclusion lucifer says the first one rohan says the second statement uh, the price of ivory went up because the government was successful in curbing hunting. So, Rohan, what is the conclusion part of it? 
the price of ivory went up is the conclusion or the government was successful in curbing hunting is the conclusion or is the whole thing the conclusion if the whole thing is the conclusion it's wrong rajivi says government efforts okay as asitima says the price uh the second statement is the conclusion vijay says first anubhav says the portion starting with stins is the conclusion chiranjeevi says the first so guys here i can clearly see there is a confusion between what exactly is the main conclusion a lot of you have got it right but though a lot of you have got the conclusion right a lot of you in fact majority of you have got this question wrong majority of you have got this question wrong guys and i want you to sit tight and listen very carefully okay this question is supposed to be an example of why it is very important to understand your stimulus to analyze the stimulus correctly all right so the first sentence is the conclusion but despite understanding that a lot of you have marked this question wrong okay so let's see daniel i know we are supposed to identify what weakens the conclusion but majority of y'all have got this question wrong so let me start with my explanation and i want you guys to focus on how i read the stimulus guys because that's the thing that is the take away from this question it's not whether you got this question right or wrong it's whether did you analyze the stimulus correctly here goes my analysis okay that's the first step of the gmat was methodology government efforts to curb the poaching of elephants okay so even if we don't know what is poaching if we read ahead for their ivory tusk we get to understand that poaching probably means hunting so we are saying government efforts uh, to stop the poaching of elephants mainly for the ivory tusk this should be were actually bad guys my bad were a success the efforts were a success in 2005 now when you read this statement primarily it appears to be a premise because it's something that's already over and immediately does not click to you that this is the conclusion all right so government tried to stop the hunting of elephants in 2005 and the author is saying that effort or those efforts were successful it means the government was able to stop the hunting of elephants in 2005 okay all right right now we are going to hold that let's see what the next statement says uh okay this will be the conclusion we'll come back to that the next statement to read is if the efforts now there's a conditional here if the efforts had not been successful so this is like saying if the efforts had not been successful is like saying the efforts were successful okay and why is the author stating this statement we'll come to that so if the efforts had not been successful the price of domestically produced ivory goods that means goods for which you would need the ivory from the ivory tusk would not have increased significantly in 2005 this basically means okay reason behind believing that the efforts were successful so why is the author giving this statement the author wants to tell us why he or she believes that the government's efforts were successful in 2005 the reason given is the price of ivory goods produced within the country increased significantly in 2005 instead of writing it like that the author here has put forward a conditional if the efforts had not been successful price would not have increased which indirectly means the price of ivory goods produced within the country increased significantly and that proves that the government's efforts were successful okay since now since guys is always a premise marker it's always telling we call it the premise trigger rather it tells us it's a premise since the producers of ivory goods do not mind buying ivory from any and all available sources within the country so why is the author giving us this piece of information probably the author is trying to tell us that these producers also buy from poachers okay 
that's why they are trying to give us this information otherwise why give us this information so it's a fact that the producers of ivory goods they are ready to buy ivory from anywhere so indirectly telling us that they are also ready to buy the ivory which these uh, poachers uh, uh, you know kind of supply and here therefore the conclusion drawn is the government was successful so if you look at the second statement it is all about facts and definitely the conclusion has to be the first statement all right we have to weaken the conclusion so if we ask ourselves selves what is the main point of this paragraph the answer would be the main point is to tell us uh, why the author believes that the government efforts to uh, curb poaching were successful it was it was successful because the price of ivory goods went up all right and the reasoning given here is since prices for domestic ivory goods increased okay the efforts to curb poaching were successful that's the reasoning given now we were to weaken this so we were to weaken the idea that the efforts to curb poaching were successful we got to prove okay we were to prove that the efforts to curb poaching were not successful okay so we've got to prove this so that's the analysis of our so here we understood that the first statement which looked like a premise was actually not the premise that was the conclusion and in order to support that conclusion the author was giving us some kind of very indirect reasoning the indirect reasoning was that uh, uh, the fact that Uh, uh the government efforts were successful is to be believed because had they had the government efforts not been successful the price of ivory goods would not have increased so indirectly giving us the fact that the price of ivory goods increased which means somehow that the efforts to curb poaching were successful this is the analysis of the stimulus okay so each of you guys needs to ask himself or herself did you analyze the stimulus exactly like this i'm going to ask you very very explicitly guys be honest with yourselves it's not about telling me did you analyze the stimulus exactly like this yes lucifer there is a logical jump there so aditya the question is 700 plus level okay i wouldn't say it's a 750 level but it is definitely a 700 plus level and you will realize that when we see the performance of this class all right so i want you each of you guys to think did i analyze this like this now i you might have got this question right guys but if your analysis was not like this then you're missing out a very very powerful strategy on cr you're missing out on something that could get each of your cr questions correct guys all right so that is one part of the strategy and we'll keep i'll, I'll give you some more examples of this some more convoluted examples some simple examples to help you along with this so just hold on to that okay now let's see some of you have honestly admitted that you did not really analyze exactly like this and i'm thank thank you for sharing that with us so 76% of you accept that you didn't quite analyze it like this all right um, and that could be one reason why you were not able to get this answer correct so let's see let's get on with our explanation guys now this was the analysis portion let's see how we can put all of that together all right now from the analysis we have understood that the author's reasoning is since prices for domestic ivory goods increased that is why we can conclude that the efforts to curb poaching were successful right the reasoning is based on the fact that the prices increased so there is a jump that the author is making here okay the author is kind of assuming certain things related to price increase now since we're talking about price increase we can quickly think about under what conditions price increases one condition is uh if the demand is high and the supply of something is fixed or is low then the price could be high or the price could be low if the demand was fixed or low and the supply of something was high all right then the price would be low so the author is clearly kind of looking at this the author is thinking that the poaching reduced and that means the supply of ivory reduced that pushed up the prices right so had the poaching of elephants gone on that poaching 
uh, would have added to maintain the supply of ivory. Okay, since the producers are willing to buy from any source. But here the reasoning is that uh, you no, know, the supply must have reduced significantly by po curbing poaching to raise the prices. Had the again, let me repeat. Had the poaching continued, this is the author's thinking, the poaching, the supply from poaching would have kept the prices from rising. All right. So clearly the author makes a jump there. The author assumes that the supply from poaching uh, reduced. And that is why the price went up. Okay. So here a weakener would be any statement that shows that the supply of the country of ivory, you know, the supply in the country of ivory from poachers was reduced this is important but not because they stopped poaching this is important we need to somehow choose an option which tells us that poachers did not stop poaching although the supply could have gone down how maybe the poachers were poaching but they were not selling in the country for example, the poacher started smuggling. Now, you may or may not come across, come up with this. You may or may not come up with this. Okay? It's not necessary. I'll show you how by analyzing the stimulus correctly, you can eliminate the answer choices. So, what have we learned from the analysis? We've learned this connection. Okay? Because prices of ivory goods shot up, that is why the author is concluding that efforts to curb poaching were successful. We have learned that from our analysis. We have understood that the author is banking his or her reasoning totally on the fact that the price of ivory goods increased, which means the author is making a jump about the supply being low. All right. So with that understanding, let's go into our answer choice analysis. Again, let me say a weakener would be any statement that shows that supply in the country of ivory from poachers was reduced okay but not because they stopped poaching let's look at a in the light of that what does a say so always the way you analyze your stimulus properly correctly similarly you should analyze your answer choice correctly too poachers started getting a significantly better bargain abroad significantly better bargain abroad means they started getting better money more money for their ivory outside the country in and around 2005. This suggests that poachers went on poaching. That means government was probably not successful in curbing poaching. But this time they were selling the ivory outside the country, thus reducing the supply of ivory domestically and raising the prices. So this choice not only tells you poachers are still poaching, this weakens your conclusion. <clears throat> right? This weakens your conclusion. It is also giving you a reason how the supply was reduced and how the uh, prices got pushed up. So it's doing both the things. And A is the correct answer. Only 18% of you got it right, guys. I'm going to explain why B is incorrect. 41% of you mark B. And this is because you did not read the stimulus properly. I'll show you how. Just hold on to your uh, chairs for the moment. But guys, can you see this here? How A very indirectly tells you that poaching might be might have been going on. But you guys thought, okay, we are talking about poachers, something, getting more money abroad. How does that matter? It matters because the entire reasoning is based on that jump about supply. And that you can understand only if you ask certain questions while analyzing the stimulus. Why is the author giving this sentence after the first sentence? What is the jump here? What is the author thinking? Okay, so let's see why B is not the answer. Any questions here, guys? I don't see any queries, but if you have any queries related to A, A is clearly telling us that poachers went on poaching. The only thing is they were not probably selling anymore within the country they were selling outside and that explains why the prices went up good anubhav even if you so in a way although you don't realize you are doing a certain amount of analysis otherwise it's not easy to get this question correct all right 
So Mahima, you're most welcome. Uh, and I'm going to keep doing this for, so again, guys, let me repeat. The learning here is not, oh, I got this question right. No, the learning here is, okay, this is how we should analyze the stimulus so that we can get even the most difficult questions correct. This is not a really very difficult question, but then if you want a high score on GMAT, you want to do well on difficult questions. So I'm glad you like that, Siddharth. In fact, at GMAT Wiz, we break down every uh, question. Every question solution is written in this way. Um, I have made the entire uh, verbal uh, course and each of the solutions, in fact, this question too has been made by me. So I can at least vouch for the fact that each and every question is made like this. So Amar Preet, you understand the jump by questioning, all right? Look at this part. I'll just go back a step. So look at this part, Amar Preet. Here, look at this part. This reasoning we've brought forward, right? How has the author reached the conclusion? The author has reached the conclusion because the prices for domestic uh, ivory goods went up. So the author is thinking that the reason behind prices going up must be supply. But has anything been given to us about the supply of ivory in the paragraph? No. That means that's a jump. The author is assuming that the supply from the poachers reduced because the poachers have stopped poaching. The author is not thinking beyond that. It is possible that the poachers went on poaching, but for some reason were not supplying in the country anymore. All right. So you have to go a little deep. Some questions give up their secrets very quickly. Some questions don't. How are you to know? So Subo, this will help you for GRE as well. Uh, very recently, I uh, coached a student also from Nepal. He was also from Nepal um, uh, for GRE and he did pretty well in GRE. So we use the same uh, subject matter. We use the same course and it's not, not so paragraph arguments in GRE aren't very different from uh, GMAT PR. Okay. So as, uh, Asitima, the best way to avoid the trap is to ask yourself, what is the main point of the author? Is the author trying to just tell me the fact that prices increased? Or is the author trying to tell me that uh, the fact that prices increased is uh, a, a symbol, is a sign of the fact that uh, the government efforts were successful? You've got to ask questions. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Vibhor, that you liked it. So let me quickly explain to all of you guys uh, how B is incorrect. Here goes B. Hmm. Read B carefully. It's like a, such a such a typical GMAT CR trap. It says the demand for IV products. Now, this is attacking the other part of it. Remember, we discussed demand and supply and price, right? This is telling us the demand for ivory products suddenly shot up following a countrywide fashion trend. So this is saying, this choice is saying that the demand is the cause. Okay, the demand is the cause. And the result is the increase in price. Now you got to ask yourself, this could have happened despite the supply remaining low, right? It is possible that uh, the poachers went on poaching, you know. Despite this, despite this, poaching might have stopped. This does not tell us whether poaching stopped or not. Okay, please understand guys. Third, the author is saying the reason why the price increased is demand going up. Not that supply went down. So, per this choice, it is quite possible that, you know, poachers, sorry, my guy, my bad guys, all right. It is possible that poachers stopped poaching, which would actually support the conclusion. Poachers stopped poaching plus demand increased equals to price increased. This does not weaken the conclusion, guys. This does not tell us that the supply from poachers 
actually did not reduce okay this is possible let me put it this way we have to show that government efforts were not successful right this is still and to show that we have to show that poachers continued poaching so here now if i change this poachers continued sorry continued poaching plus demand increased then also price could have increased so price increase could have happened because of any of the reasons in fact this kind of shows that the price increased not because of poaching going down but because of the demand shooting up and therefore b is incorrect we had to kind of prove that poachers did not stop poaching this does not prove any which way okay let me see some of your uh, so daniel says it's about finding the most plausible scenario that undermines the author's conclusion absolutely daniel amar preet is saying an assumption made by an author in this question is used to weaken the conclusion so can i conclude that to know an assumption the argument is very important to strengthen as well as weaken the question well that would be a roundabout process amar preet but yes in order to know the assumption you know you need to know what is given and what is not given so you need to understand the basis of the reasoning the basis of the reasoning was prices so what do we need to know about prices we need to know why the prices rise or why the prices fall and therein lies the gap okay yes daniel so uh, swapnil that's the problem b is neither strengthening nor weakening that's why i've written it's ambiguous all right whether the poachers continued poaching or did not continue poaching this choice tells us the demand increase led to the price increase so how are we to decide whether this proves that the government uh, efforts were successful or were not successful it doesn't right clear guys so i hope you liked this explanation of b is b clear guys why b is not the answer is it clear to all of you why b is not the answer wonderful so that is what the power of correct analysis of the stimulus is all about guys and i'm going to show you a very simple way of doing this analysis just give me a little time some of you are saying you're not clear about b please ask your question uh i think i need to rephrase my question and reset the poll are you clear why b is incorrect guys are all of you clear why b is incorrect if you're clear say yes i still don't have an okay guys any confusion related to b please ask your questions b is telling us let me show you a little bit for b okay let's say poachers okay stopped or reduced and let's say poachers continue okay if they stopped supply went down if they continued supply uh remain same okay let's say remain same i'm putting a equal to sign here now along with these two we are being told by this choice that demand increased okay in both the cases demand increased and price increased now guys even if this even if poachers did not stop this choice tells us the price increased because of demand so it doesn't clearly tell us whether the poachers stopped or not because in either case we are being given an alternate cause here all right we are given an alternate reason sorry not alternate cause we are given an alternate reason to show why price increase but we have to weaken a different reason we have to weaken uh, the fact that uh, uh, the government uh, the supply from poachers 
um, you know, reduced. We have to weaken that. We have to show that supply from poachers did not reduce. So I think it's clear by now. Very good, Amarpi. That's a very good explanation. B is simply uh, proving the given premise, but not weakening the conclusion. So Mahima, it doesn't apply to A because A clearly tells you that they are getting a better bargain outside the country, which means it is hinting at the fact that they are still poaching, but not selling in the country. If, if so in Jenna's two questions, which is what we teach at GMAT Wiz, when you're looking at these uh, strength and weaken questions, the answer choices are to be taken as true. So if it is true that the poachers are getting a better bargain abroad, then high chances that they are selling their product abroad, which means it is possible that they are still continuing to poach. Okay. So, great. Yes, yes, very good. B says price is likely to have increased due to demand spike, but that means poaching has stayed the same. It could have stayed the same, PS. It could have decreased. It may not have decreased. We don't know for sure. All right. That is why. P.S. B says that price increased because of demand. So we cannot for sure say whether poaching decreased or not. And that is why we cannot apply B. I'll come to each Ranjivi. Okay. P.S. So I hope that is clear to you. Uh, C says. So nobody marks C. I'm just quickly going to gloss over C. C says that. They, uh, the poachers, the independent poachers formed bigger groups uh, which could face increased government guarding. This actually kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, it doesn't prove anything that the poaching stopped or the poaching continued. It just says they formed bigger groups. But it is possible that uh, uh, government was able to kind of control them also. So C is out. B Again, says they identified identified a unique and untraceable technique. Whether they use the technique, we don't know. Whether they were allowed to use the technique, whether the government was able to stop them in using the technique, anything can happen here. So this, this is out of scope. This is just telling us that they were able to kind of find out a technique which was unique and uh, untraceable to them. Nobody could trace it back to them. But this does not tell us that government was not successful. So this is out of scope. 18% of you mark D. E. Chiranjeevi was asking about this. So Chiranjeevi here goes. E says the producers of ivory goods are always ready to pay exorbitant prices for raw ivory. Since they know that they can recover their money. Now does this tell us that they are paying exorbitant prices to the uh, poachers or to anybody else? It is quite possible that, uh, you know, this choice adds to the al already given information that producers are willing to buy ivory. Increase in price, okay, could have happened because producers were buying ivory at high prices. You know, the demand was higher and thus adding to their cost of production. So this choice does not indicate why the producers were buying ivory at high prices. This doesn't tell us whether the poachers were poaching or not. It could have been because ivory was low in supply. Or it could have been because the sellers of ivory had hiked their prices for some reason. So again, this is out of scope, Chiranji. All right. It could have, because this doesn't clearly tell us that it was the poachers who stopped poaching or it was the poachers who continued poaching. You have to understand that we have to prove that poachers continued poaching. And only A does that. All the other choices give you some other reason to explain how that price went up. But we have to give the only reason that we have to cut down is prices increased because not because poaching stopped. All right. So it's a little twisted question, but nonetheless. Yes, Chiranjeev, it's a distortion. Perfect. So Pratik, a cause and effect. Uh, uh, we, I'm going to discuss about causal arguments today, Pratik, uh, towards the end. So the third part strategy is about using frameworks. And we have a causal framework there for you. So I'm going to quickly explain how to read the stimulus properly. See, all of you know already, right, that uh, some of the structures 
on. This should be intermediate conclusion. These are some of the possible structures of an argument. We already know this, right? But seldom do we analyze our stimulus by connecting these in this manner, by identifying the various components of the argument. Some of you already made the mistake. You did not try to actively identify that the first sentence was the conclusion and how the second sentence was the reasoning standing behind the conclusion. Now I'm going to, this is a very simple, uh, uh, this is a very simple uh, uh, argument guys. I want each of you to write down, okay, for yourselves, write it down on a piece of paper in front of you. What is a premise here? What is a counter premise here? What is an intermediate conclusion? And what is the conclusion? Wherever it is applicable. Quickly, I'll give you 30 seconds. 30, no, I'll give you one minute for it. Quickly, go ahead. Write it down with you. So, Chiranjeev, always you have to analyze your uh, stimulus correctly. Write down the answer choice. The, sorry, write down the conclusion in your own words. And ask yourself when you are analyzing each, each, each answer choice. I'm going to talk about scope of conclusion next. So the answer to your question is you define the scope of the conclusion in order to uh, recognize the distortion. All right, Chiranji. So one powerful strategy at a time. Identify, write down for yourselves which portion of this argument is a premise, counter premise and so on. You don't have to write down the answer in the chat box. Just write it down for yourselves only. It's a very simple one. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to read this and I want, I've deliberately chosen a very simple argument to show you what to ask, how to go about reading it. All right. Here goes. The village of Green Ditch is facing a shortage of water due to failed monsoons. Okay. So this is a fact because this is happening now. All right. And right now, I don't know why the author is telling me this. So I'll just call it a fact. There is a village called Green Ditch and there is scarcity of water. Why is that scarcity there? Explicitly, this, they are telling us that failed monsoon. So monsoon must be something which kind of brings water if we don't already know it. All right. Let me read on. So, so for the time being, because I don't know the role that this sentence is playing, I'll call it a premise. A fact is a premise. Let's read the next sentence. It is expected. Now, when it is given, it is expected. Who is expecting? It's a third party opinion. Had the author uh, expected it, the author would not have written, it is expected. It is expected is always written when it is about a general expectation. All right. So the third party opinion here is, it is expected that the yield of sugarcane this year will be very low. Now you ask yourself, right guys, is there a connection between this sentence, you know, this sentence and the previous sentence? This is how you question your, uh, this is how you relate your stimulus, guys. It's very, very important to do this, especially if it's a very convoluted, here it is very simple statement, but think, imagine there are two very convoluted statements and you are not relating it and you're moving ahead. Maybe you're losing out on your understanding. So you ask yourself, is there a connection between this sentence and the previous sentence? This is a conclusion drawn on the basis of the previous sentence. Now you ask yourself, is this the main conclusion? Well, right now we don't know. Okay. So for us right now, the first sentence is a premise. The second sentence is a conclusion drawn on the basis of the first uh, premise. Because there is a shortage of water, the yield of sugar cane will be very low. That is what the expectation is telling. However, now the moment there is a however, we know there is a shift in thought. Okay. However, the farmers have used seeds modified to produce plants that require very little water. So now the farmers, this so this portion is telling us about another fact. Okay. Uh, that farmers have used seeds which won't need a lot of water. 
But then you ask yourself, isn't this against whatever we have read so far? So far, we have read that the sugar cane yield is expected to be low. But here we are saying that the farmers have used seeds uh, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, that have been modified. These seeds will produce plants that don't need a lot of water. So even if there is no water, the yield could probably be high. All right. So yes, this is definitely against what we have read so far. Let's see. This is also a premise because this is a fact. Therefore, so therefore is clearly uh, something that marks as the conclusion. A decent yield of crops can be expected. So clearly this is the final word that the author has. And this is the main conclusion. This, so the author is saying despite the fact that the, there is scarcity of water, and despite the fact that because of scarcity of water, people don't expect the sugarcane yield to be very high. But because of some other fact, a decent yield of this crop can be expected. So here we can identify that the first conclusion was an intermediate conclusion. Okay. We can break the, uh, uh, this entire argument into this manner. So the first premise is a counter premise because it is going against the main conclusion. See, because the main conclusion is decent yield of crops can be expected. And the first sentence is saying facing a shortage of water. So that's clearly a counter premise. All right. And then you have the second sentence, which is the intermediate conclusion. All right. And we see that the intermediate conclusion doesn't agree with the main conclusion. Correct. So for the main conclusion, you have a premise. For the intermediate conclusion, you also have a premise, but that premise is a counter premise for the main conclusion. So all in all, you know which things. So here later on, when you know you, you, what you can doubt and what you cannot doubt, you can doubt this. Any third party argument is open to question, but we cannot doubt that there is a scarcity of water. We cannot doubt that the farmers have used seeds modified to produce plants that require very little water. In fact, have you noted that the counter premise is actually a premise for the intermediate conclusion and the intermediate conclusion is a counter premise for the main conclusion. See the relationship guys. So the more you train yourself. So Lucifer, the final conclusion will always be the main conclusion. Yes, but that doesn't mean the final conclusion will always be the sentence which is written at the end. The, the conclusion can be written anywhere. But when we say final conclusion, we are saying that's the final, the main message that the author wants to project. No, Julia, conclusion is not that the modified seeds are a guarantee for a decent yield. The conclusion is that because there is slight modification to what you are saying, but yes, you are also mostly correct. That because the farmers are using seeds, which will bear plants that don't need a lot of water. Therefore, we can expect a high yield of crops. So yes, uh, Julia, in that sense, you are correct. Absolutely. All right, guys. So did you understand how we should connect? Did you understand how we should relate the premise and the intermediate conclusion and the counter premise and all of it with the main conclusion? This is very important. And if you do this for all questions, you will find that you will very easily be able to eliminate the answer choices. Yes, Lucifer, there can be a supporting conclusion. So intermediate conclusion can support the main conclusion. In this case, it is opposing the uh, main conclusion. Intermediate conclusion, Aditya, here is saying that we can expect a high yield. But the main conclusion is quite the opposite to that, right? It's quite the opposite to that. That is why we are saying that in a way it is countering the main conclusion, Aditya. So uh, here is a, another one for you quickly. Now this time I'm going to bring up a poll for you guys. And I want you to put your answers in the poll. Because before this, I didn't ask you to put it in the polls. But this is also fairly simple. I want you guys to give this method a shot. Okay, go ahead.
All right, guys, I am going to count five. Don't worry, Daniel. Write down the correct answer with uh, yourself. Keep it and you can check it. It's very easy to go wrong if you are not careful, you know, guys. I have, I myself have made mistakes sometimes because I hurried, because I did not analyze the stimulus correctly. And this can happen to anybody. So you want to make analyzing the stimulus correctly a, a, a powerful tool in your arsenal. You need to make sure that it becomes a part of your muscle memory to analyze the stimulus in a certain manner. Okay. All right, guys. So I'm going to end the poll. 70% of you believe that the first one is correct and you are right. Very good, guys. All right. Uh, let me ask you a question. Did the example before this help you? So, Amar Preet. Uh, at least you need to identify which premise is helping the argument, which is not. Okay. You should be able to differentiate which premise is helping the argument and which is not. At least. So in order to understand the conclusion, at least you should be able to understand what kind of information in the paragraph is given to help you reach the conclusion. And what is given to help you go against the conclusion. All right. So very quickly, let me show you guys. Again, I have chosen not a very difficult example. The first sentence very clearly is a premise, right? It tells you that there is this new technology for the manufacture of paper and it requires less fuel and water. Premise 2 tells you, again, it's a piece of information. It says, on the other hand, the new technology requires a lot of labor. All right. So right now, we don't know which, prem which is the premise and which is the counter premise. Although we know that these two pieces of information are kind of telling you about two different aspects of the new technology. One is talking about the advantage. The other is talking about the disadvantage. And this could therefore offset the reduction in fuel and water costs. So because on the other hand, we are saying we might think of it as a counter premise for the moment. All right. And clearly, therefore, is indicating an intermediate conclusion. I'm calling it the intermediate conclusion for now because I haven't reached the end. I might change my mind later on. All right. So clearly, the author tells us one advantage about the new uh, technology, then a disadvantage. And based on the disadvantage, a conclusion is drawn. Okay. Again, the author presents a premise which is giving us an advantage of the new technology. All right. And then the main conclusion that overall cost of paper manufacture will likely reduce. So despite the fact that there are some drawbacks, the author primarily wants to tell us that uh, the overall cost of paper manufacture will reduce because there are certain advantages that outweigh the disadvantages. So if you really see premise one and premise three. Okay. Premise one and premise three. So the counter premise is going to be seen as kind of premise two. All right. And this is premise one. This is premise three. So premise one and three support the main conclusion. Whereas premise two or what we call the counter premise counters the main conclusion. All right. Similarly, premise two, that is the counter premise supports the intermediate conclusion and the intermediate conclusion acts as a counter premise for the main conclusion. So 70% of you got that right. Again, in the exam, you don't have to sit and talk about, oh, this is the premise, this is our counter premise, but you have to understand the argument that the author here is giving us some advantages and some disadvantages of uh, um, uh, the new technology. And finally, the author is telling us that the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. So in that sense, you are incorporating the counter premise. I hope that answers your question, uh, Amar Preet. Uh, Pooja, I think if you're having problem reading the slide, maybe you could rejoin. Sometimes some kind of glitch comes up in the middle of it, in the middle of the whole thing. Let me now, so guys, the main point is the correct approach to CR question is starting with the power of correct analysis of the stimulus. Apply it, you will see a difference. That's my guarantee. You'll think of me 
next time when you analyze when you sit to analyze the stimulus only after that comes your pre thinking or scope of conclusion and then only answer choice elimination if you just read the analysis uh, stimulus briefly and jump to answer choice elimination more likely or uh, more frequently you will go wrong so how to analyze the stimulus in the most comprehensive manner this at gmat wiz we dedicate uh, a, a huge amount of uh, time to explaining this to students to telling them how to analyze or learn how to analyze the stimulus properly you will see whole four hours nearly is dedicated for helping you understand the way an argument is structured how an argument is uh, an argument reaches the conclusion how the various components are interwoven okay guys so that was all about the power of analyzing the stimulus correctly now we're going to talk about defining the scope of the argument how many of you all are excited to learn about this um you're welcome tarang so guys there is a question i'd like to ask because one of our um attendees is facing a problem can you guys read the slide clearly can you guys see the slide clearly so uh neha neha can you see the slide clearly everybody can see the slide clearly pooja so i think it's something to do at your end all right close the browser refresh and rejoin or if you if you are using any other browser try changing the browser sometimes that also helps all right pooja so because i okay pooja now it's fine fine so yes guys all excited na good now very often you know we very commonly say the most common mistake made during ace ace is at gmat with answer choice elimination you will find that 70% of the time uh, the choice is incorrect because it is out of scope all right so that's and this is where most of the time students make the mistake you choose uh, uh, an incorrect answer choice a choice which is out of scope you select that as the correct answer choice and that is one of the most common mistakes made during the elimination process why does this happen this happens because you haven't defined the scope you haven't defined that your answer choice must fall within this scope and not outside it today we are going to talk about the power of identifying beforehand the scope of the argument or the scope of the conclusion and using that scope to eliminate the answer choices this is a question some of you might be familiar with it this is an official question guys it's not a gma quiz question all right this is an official question i want you guys to give it your best shot and then i'm going to show you how we define the scope of the conclusion and how we use that uh, scope to eliminate the out of scope choices so get set and go guys get started all right guys your time's almost up now a lot of you might have solved this question earlier but today the learning that you will take home with you from this question is how to define the scope of the argument and how to use such kind of scope elim, uh, how to use this scope to eliminate the incorrect choice so don't think about whether this is already a known question or unknown think about the learning that you're going to get from this question and how you will be able to apply that to the other cr questions okay so here goes my countdown please put in your polls 5 4 3 2 and 1 okay well um so here goes 7% of you have marked a as you can see 21% of you have marked b 17% of you have marked c 
39% of you have marked D and 14% of you have marked E. So that's quite a distribution given that there are nearly about more than 100 of you here. All right. So let's see where some of you went wrong and why. Okay. Let's get started. Now, while I define the scope, listen very carefully to how I am analyzing the stimulus and how I'm reaching the scope because that's very important. The first step required in order to be able to define the scope is to analyze the stimulus correctly, which we have already seen. And you will see, although I don't mention the word premise, counter premise and so on, I do read my, uh, uh, my stimulus carefully. So here goes. Last year, so we're talking about last year, okay? All refuse, refuse is waste, collected by Shelbyville City Services was incinerated, which is burnt. So last year, all the waste that was collected was burnt. Okay, that's a fact. The premise one tells us about what happened last year in Shelbyville. All right. This incineration, this burning, so we are now reading the second sentence. So the first sentence is the premise. This incineration generated a large quantity of residual ash. That means we know that if you burn something, ash is formed. So this sentence is just telling us that a lot of ash was produced, okay, by all that burning. Fine. So far, we don't know what is the connection between these two sentences, except that all the refuse collected was burned and a lot of ash was generated. So all of it is about the same event. Let's read on. In order to reduce the amount of residual ash, so the target is in order to reduce the res residual, uh, sorry, in order to reduce the amount of ash, Shelbyville generates this year. Okay. So I would say, here in premise three, it seems we are going to talk about a plan and a goal. How do I know this? Well, I know that the moment you have in order to, it usually implies an objective or a goal or an aim. So here we have a certain goal. The goal is to reduce the amount of ash Shelbyville is going to generate this year. So last year it generated a huge amount of ash. This year, we want to reduce that amount. And how much do we want to reduce it by? We want to reduce it to half of last year's total. All right. So this is the objective. And what is the plan? The city, so in order to do that, the city has revamped, or that means they have kind of made changes to the collection program. Collection, which collection program? Collection of refuse so the goal is to reduce the amount of ash uh, generated by the burning of shelby wheel waste this year okay and by how much to reduce the ash and bring it down to half of last year half the amount of ash ash last year so that means in your mind you can think if last year the amount of ash produced was x then this year, the goal is to produce only x by 2 or half of x. All right. Have it very clear in your mind. That's the goal. This year, city services. Now, let's read the next sentence. So, so far, we have three sentences all going in the same direction. Premise 1 telling us uh, refuse was burned. A lot of ash was generated. Premise 3 is telling us about a plan and its goal. The plan is to reduce the ash that is going to be produced this year by burning the waste. Let's read further. This year, city services will separate for recycling enough refuse. Now, understand this. City services will separate for recycling. So, what is the connection of this sentence with the previous sentence? It talks about what revamping is going to be done. What is the revamping? Separate for recycling enough refuse to reduce the number of truckloads of refuse to be incinerated to half of last year's number. What does that mean? So this year, they are telling us 
the city service will collect and separate waste into two parts one part will be sent for burning and other will be sent for recycling so out of the total waste i am telling myself okay one part so this will be the separation done and they will reduce the number of truckloads of refuse to be incinerated to half that means this will be half of last year's truckload right so we are basically saying half the number of truckloads sent for burning last year okay if one second how many if we are saying hold on a second guys half the number of truckloads sent for burning this year so if this year you are sending 100 truckloads uh, if last year this was last year if this was last year then this year they are going to reduce and bring it down to 50 truckloads right is this clear so far guys basically we have two scenarios last year and this year okay so last year total waste okay 100 truck loads that mean 100 truck pulls all burnt and let's say x ash produced right this clarity i want you guys to have this year what they are planning to do revamping they will collect the total waste then they will divide okay to be burnt and to be recycled okay to be burnt will be 50 truckloads and ash produced will be half of x is this clear guys let me reset the poll if this is clear you will realize where you made the mistake is this clear so if you are not doing this kind of a uh, clear analysis of the stimulus you will not be able to define the scope okay great i can see all of you have understood this clearly so that means the correct answer choice okay will be all about this any choice that shows me that the 50 truckloads will reduce the ash by half will be my scope see i draw a circle any choice that tells me that by reducing 50 to, to by reducing the number of truckloads to half the ash produced will be half that choice is going to fall within my scope now see how i define the scope we have already got the idea that the city services plan to separate the waste in such a manner as to reduce the number of truckloads to half the stimulus contains no conclusion we have to analyze the question stem the question stem is saying which of the following is required for the revamped collection program to achieve its aim so required okay we need to identify a choice which will be needed to ensure that the goal of the revamped collection program is met so the conclusion is this this is the conclusion the revamped collection program will be successful in reducing the amount of residual ash generated this year to half of last year's amount the answer choice has to be true because we're talking about required so this is an assumption question clear guys okay that was all about analyzing the stimulus and the question stem now the scope if and it's a very simple step only thing is you need to articulate it to yourself Conclusion is revamped collection program will reduce amount of residual ash to 
half of last year's amount. So my scope will be, okay, the concern of the argument, the scope is the concern of the argument, right? The concern of the argument is the reduction of residual ash this year to half of last year's amount. So my scope will be defined like this. Any new information that shows beyond doubt that the reduction of residual ash this year will be half of last year's will fall within the scope of the argument. Thus, the scope is defined by the concern of the conclusion. So scope is defined by the concern of the conclusion. The conclusion is concerned by with the reduction of residual ash. All right. Okay. So residual ash re reduced to half of last year's amount is our scope. So it should be new information. Okay. But if it does not impact the conclusion, it means it is not within the scope. So what is within the scope? Any answer choice. This is your scope here. This is the scope. And when you are examining each answer choice, tell, ask yourself, does this answer choice tell me that ash will be reduced to half? Just keep asking yourself. Just ask yourself, does this choice, see I'm going to write it here. Does this choice, any choice that you're taking up, tell me ash will be reduced to half. Ask yourself this question. All right. I am going to bring up the polls again, guys. Okay. And if you want to kind of choose your answer again, you can. Let me bring up the poll for you. I'll bring up the questions also. Note down that question and ask that question. Copy that question down quickly, guys. Take down that question. All right. Does this choice tell me ash will be reduced to half? And let me bring up the question slide for you. Great. Hold on. Yeah. If you want, you can. Uh, change your poll. So keep asking, every time you take up an answer choice, ask yourself, does this tell me that residual ash will reduce to half? Does this tell me residual ash will reduce to half? Ask yourself, keep asking that. Does this tell me residual ash will be reduced by half? This is the question you need to ask. Okay, I'll write the question also. Examine each choice against this. Go ahead, guys. Take your time. I'll count five. And of course, apart from the scope, you what, what also helps you and eliminate the choices is your understanding of the stimulus. So scope alone will not do the trick. You need to analyze your stimulus very, very, very well. Okay, guys, I'm going to end the poll. Now, as you can see, the previous poll results I'm calling out, previous one, and you can compare it with this one. Previously, 7% of you marked A, this time 6%. Previously, 20% of you marked B, uh, sorry, 21% of you marked B, this time 20%. Previously, 17% uh, of you marked C, this time 20% of you. However, the game changer is 39% of you had marked D. This time, after the scope, 53% of you have defined D as the correct, uh, sorry, identified D as the correct answer, which is the correct answer. And 14% uh, of you had marked E earlier. None of you chose E this time. So you can see the, how effective this strategy is. Identifying or defining the scope, guys. It's very, very effective. Do let me know, guys, 
how many of you all found the strategy the uh, scope of conclusion helpful and you can do this for every question you don't even have to pre think you don't even have to pre think see i did not do any pre thinking with you i just did the stimulus analysis i just help you define the scope of the conclusion we reached a question and we asked that question when we examined each answer choice all right great so let's quickly go through our so that was the analysis that we did and we defined the scope the scope was identified as something that concerns the argument so the scope is always defined by the concern of the conclusion the conclusion here is concerned with the reduction of residual ash so the scope of my argument is any answer choice that falls within this scope any answer choice that actually shows me beyond doubt that residual ash will reduce this year now let's see where you guys have gone wrong let's see the gap we are given that the number of truck load to be sent this year will be reduced by half so if last year 100 truck loads were sent this year 50 truck loads will be sent this we have been told now what we have what we don't know is last year the amount of ash generated was x okay per truck that means 100 by x amount of ash was generated per truck this year they are going to reduce the truck load but do we know how much ash will be generated per truck maybe somehow this year more ash might be generated per truck than last so even if they are reducing it by half ash might still uh, land up being more so the missing link is we do not know how much ash will be generated by each truck load this year only thing we know know is this year 50 truck loads will be sent for burning half of last year so the assumption is 50 truck of burnt waste will not produce more than half of x or in other words a truckload of waste sent for burning this year will not produce more ash than the truckload of waste sent for burning last year produced okay assumption made is reduction in half reduction in waste to half so reducing the waste in half is equal to reduction in residual ash to at least half that is the leap that is the jump and based on that we can also identify the correct answer so a lot of you mark a a is saying this year no material that city services could separate for recycling we are not concerned whether the recycled material will be burnt or not we are concerned with the waste that will be burnt recycling incineration okay is not our even if a does not happen let's say that um in this year we are seeing that uh no material that city services could separate for recycling will not be burnt so we are basically saying all the material that could be separated for recycling will be burnt so even if this does not happen it will not change the given information the reduction in truck load will occur even if city services could not separate material for recycling they will still reduce it to half the truck load so a is incorrect out of scope okay even if they are not able to separate even if they are not able to separate the material for incinerating they will still reduce the truck load to half and that half whether it will produce ash or not we don't know whether it will reduce the ash or not we don't know so this choice does not tell us whether ash will be reduced and therefore a is not the answer b b talks about cost guys does the scope of the argument cover cost ask yourself was the concern of the argument cost will be increased or cost will be decreased no i'm not even going to discuss this this is not within the scope of our argument 20% of you still went ahead and marked this guys why does this tell you that the ash will reduce by half it is saying separating the material from uh, recyclable material from material will cost shall be will less does that tell you that residual ash will be reduced 
it is still talking about cost of disposing the ash but what about the amount of ash so by using the scope of the argument you could have eliminated b 20% of you got it wrong the refuse collected by city services will contain larger proportion of recyclable material this year we already are going to separate the recyclable uh, recyclable material right so this is not a must be true condition please remember 20% of you mark this does it tell you that the amount of ash will reduce it says refuse collected will contain larger proportion of recyclable material this will be separated okay this will be separated and the truck load will be reduced to 50 trucks this still doesn't tell us whether the 50 trucks will reduce the ash or not so see is out this tells us this the refuse burned this year will generate no more residual ash this talks about the amount of ash this tells you okay that the amount of ash per unit of refuse will be less than equal to the amount of ash per unit last year or in other words the incinerator would generate less than equal to the amount of residual ash produced last year at least it would be reduced by half and d is the correct answer so in fact even if you are not able to process it this much all you need to do is ask yourself does this tell us that the reduction of ash will take place yes it does no other choice tells you that do you see this guys amar preet you are so the purpose of defining the scope is you are bringing in an element and you are making an assumption you are making an assumption that cost will somehow reflect the reduction in amount burnt or amount of ash produced so guys we are not comparing total amount with per truck load ya aditya we are saying the amount that was sent for burning last year the amount that was sent for burning last year was 100 trucks this year the amount will be reduced to half the truck loads so now this year the amount that will be sent for burning will be reduced to 50 truck loads so the assumption is 50 truck loads also means i will be reducing the ash burned ash produced sorry so amarpreet aditya is it clear now nikhila neha or uh, amarpreet it doesn't say it will be same no more means it could be less it could be same so even if it is the same it means half of last year right and it could if it is less than it will automatically mean reduce so no more means same or less and we only wanted that amarpreet no more means either same okay so remember last year 100 trucks x as uh, uh, x as ash 50 trucks this year x by half ash so even if it is same as last year it will still produce half the amount and it could produce less aditya the one that is not sent for incineration is recycled it is not burnt we are not concerned with that okay let me explain once more aditya and amarpreet let me take you guys back to the part where hold on a second wait now look at this now all of you look at this amarpreet aditya see last year all the waste was burned so let's say last year the total truck loads the total number of trucks full of waste that was sent for burning was 100 and all this 100 truck load waste was burned so x amount of ash was produced clear now this year what they are doing is they are dividing the waste aditya okay they are dividing the waste one part of the waste is going to be burned 
the other part is going to be recycled. We are not concerned with the recycle because that is not going to be burnt. Now, the amount that is going to be burnt, they are going to reduce it down to half of last year's truckload. So that means whatever extra is there, they will put it aside for recycling. Whatever extra is col collected will be put aside for recycling. They will only send 50 truckloads to burn this year. But we don't know the composition of that truckload. It is possible that they are reducing the truckload by half. But maybe whatever kind of waste is there in that truckload is producing more ash. Then what will happen? Then even by reducing the truckload by half, more ash will be produced. So the assumption made is by reducing the truckload to half, the ash will also be reduced to half. Is that clear, Aditya, Amarpreet? Do let me know. Aditya, recyclable waste is not our concern at all. Recycling means you are separating it. Yes, Aditya, you are right. Absolutely. The assumption is each truckload will produce the same amount of ash. So, half truckloads, half ash. That is the leap media. Oh my God, are there two Aditya? So I hope I am catering to both of you because I am not being able to see any difference. Neha, Amarpreet, Amarpreet is saying, isn't there an assumption that cause we are still assuming that last year the amount could have been half. Amarpreet, last year the total amount was burnt. Okay, and the total amount was producing X. How do we know that half of last year's amount will produce half of X? That's an assumption, isn't it? Maybe last year's waste was of a different type. Amarpreet, all assumptions are created only. Because if that assumption is not true, your conclusion will break. Say, if 50 truckloads produce more ash, then will they be able to reduce the amount to la half of last year's? Will the revamped program be able to reduce it to half? No, right? Okay, great guys. So scope of the argument is the second most powerful strategy, I would say. And now we are gonna move very quickly to the third most powerful strategy. By the way, in uh, a GMAT's WIS student would be learning all about the scope of the argument throughout the entire course. You know, every time he or she, uh, we teach right from the beginning, uh, how to categorize the different kind of CR questions. We divide them into two genuses and each genus has its own scope defined separately. Okay. And how to define the scope really helps you to ask those questions when you are examining each answer choice. All right. And when you're examining each answer choice and you're able to ask the right question, you're able to eliminate the incorrect answer choice as you saw in this case. We're going to talk about frameworks for pre-thinking, guys. Now, this is something we came across. Like we thought that a pre-thinker really faces a problem sometimes. You don't know in which direction you should think. Sometimes you come up with the wrong assumption. And when you're going through the answer choice, you see that none of the assumptions match your answer choice, right? And then you land up choosing the incorrect choice. So we thought, is there a possible way that we could tell a student, guide a student in which direction to think more efficiently. All right. And we came up with this pre-thinkers guide. So these are simple formulas or frameworks which you can use to pre-think in a particular direction more efficiently and more effectively in such a manner that you don't come up with incorrect assumptions. See, we have kind of, uh, through our research, we have identified some very common construction types. We are not saying that these are the only four types, but these are the most common types and you would have come across them. Today itself, we saw one of them, okay? The plan goal. Typically, you will find a plan, the goal, some detail about the plan and goal and the conclusion is usually either about the success or failure of the plan. Then you have the causality questions, okay? In such constructions, you have a cause and effect relationship given to you in the conclusion. Then the fourth 
question type is comparison all right and you will find these uh, plan goal comparison um causality questions in all types of questions assumptions trend then we can sometimes the same question might be of two different types so we have frameworks to help you pre think for each of these question types today we are going to discuss one of the frameworks all right and for more i'm going to share uh, with you the free trial version of our course uh, and you can i'll share the link with you you can uh, look at that link just give me a moment let me just quickly bring up that link um by the way guys we're starting a crash course tomorrow and this crash course comprises 25 live sessions the verbal sessions are going to be taken with me and um the other quant sessions will be so we'll divide 25 uh, sessions into half quant and half verbal and these will be live sessions taken over the weekends that is saturdays and sundays over a period of the next couple of months and um, we will also be giving you access to the quant and the verbal course so i'm just going to quickly uh, give you the free trial link Give me a moment. You guys can. I will be uh, sharing the PDF of the session as well. Haman, we usually share the recording of the webinar as well. Okay. So, anyways, let me quickly continue with this. So, there are these four most common types. Okay. And today we are going to discuss the framework that you can use to uh, solve causal arguments. Okay. so what is causality in gmat cr some stimulus contains a cause and effect relationship all right and um, you know say in this case event a is causing event b so event a is supposed to be the cause and uh, the effect of that cause uh, is event b this is a cause and effect relationship for example if you look at this the unusually low amount of rainfall this year caused led to resulted in low production of corn in this case event a is um the unusually low amount of rainfall and that has caused the low production in corn so this kind of relationship is known as a cause effect relationship and i'm sure a lot of you know this what are the assumptions behind a causal argument because you have to understand the framework the framework works on the assumptions so a causal argument contains typical assumption the assumption is same in all causal argument guys that's a good part of it in other cr arguments you have different assumptions but in a causal argument the assumption is always same for example if you look at this question this uh, argument the number of vehicles I i'll give you uh, a few seconds to read this read this so subu to answer your questions as i said uh, we we don't have a separate uh, let's say course for gre although i am right now involved in making one but definitely we can train you to take the gre classes we have trained students one of them has scored a 3 um, i think 330 uh, the other i was talking about has scored around 326 or so that's 340 is the highest that you can score you already know that okay guys so i'm sure all of you have read that now very clearly here <clears throat> there's a premise given that there was one event and there was another event there was an increase in the number of vehicles being driven on the road and there was an increase in air pollution and it happened in the same time that is last one year so it's not given to us that event a happened first or event b happened first it's just given the two things happened in the last one year okay but the author is drawing the conclusion that event a must have led to event b so the author is assuming that event a happened first and event b happened after that okay so this is a causal argument so what is the assumption here the, the author is making the author is assuming that event a must have happened before event b if event b took place first then the author can't say that event a caused event b right the second assumption the author is making is nothing else caused event b 
that means the increase in air pollution was not because of some industry being set up or something it was only because of the increase in the number of vehicles being driven so no alternate cause is the second assumption third assumption is the effect did not cause the cause that means an increase in air pollution did not make people drive more number of vehicles on the road all right what we call reverse causality so three assumptions okay event a must have happened before event b there is no alternate cause that caused event b and there is no reverse causality these are the three assumptions that the author makes and our framework is designed based on these three assumptions so here's the framework the core assumption is no other cause is responsible for the stated effect so the first step is to identify the causality let's call the cause x and let's call the effect y so the first step in the framework is to prove that x happened before y so any piece of information which says x happened before y any piece of information which says no other relationship or correlation is there no coincidence is there there is no common cause all right nothing that could have led to both the being, both the cause and effect being effect that would be one of the answer choices any answer choice which says that there is no alternate cause would be the second guideline if there were any other cause possible behind the effect the author cannot arrive at the conclusion and the third guideline would be no reverse causality so that's the framework x happened before y no alternate cause no reverse causality any choice which tells you any of these is an assumption here's a question for you to solve guys if you want you can use the framework otherwise i'm going to show you um how to apply the framework so subu i'll tell you one thing you can do something i'll give you the link i'll share the link you can talk to a strategy expert about uh, your gre classes so there's the link there i'm going to stick it i'm going to send it to everybody also that's uh, you can book your calls to speak to our strategy experts all right piyush has scored scored 740 on the gmat i'm going to put it as a sticky message also out there so guys i was telling you um, okay so this is the last question we are doing guys and i will definitely share the pdf post this question so subu you can get in touch with piyush on that link you can schedule a call with him free of cost all right guys so i want you to quickly put in your answer choices i'll count 5 5 4 3 2 and 1 this is a gmat whiz question do let me know uh how you enjoyed this question so i'm going to end the polls now Raghun the recording of this webinar will be mailed to you if you have registered for this webinar using your email id all right okay guys so i'm going to end the polls hmm none of you have marked the correct choice by the way and i am going to show you how you could have marked this you could have got this correct by using the framework guys all right by the way a quick poll uh, so you can see 35% of you marked a 23% of you marked b 5% of you marked c nobody marked d and 35%
um, of you marking. Sorry, I think uh, some of you have marked the correct answer. My bad. Some of you have marked the correct answer. Sorry, my bad. There was a simple, simple jumble up here. So, guys, um, many more of you. In fact, there's a real competition between A, B, and E. Let's see what is the correct answer and how you could have used the framework to reach this answer. All right. Just before that, guys, a quick, uh, because we want you to help us understand how we can uh, make these kind of uh, webinars more interesting. There's a quick poll there. Um, you could do that while I'm going to explain this. All right. So in the chat boxes, you can tell me how you found this question. How did you find this question, guys? Good, bad, tough, easy, challenging, what? And this is again another example of GMAT quiz question, the kind that we saw right at the beginning. Yes. Okay, Neha finds it a good question. How about the others, Aditya? Now I don't know which Aditya this is, but uh, Aditya found it challenging. One of the Adityas found it challenging. How about the others, guys? Did you like the question? So Mahima says, question is straightforward. Yes, question is straightforward, Mahima. But you're right, the answers are rather confusing. Annie found it challenging. Angie found it medium. How about the others? Amarpreet says, tricky options. Had to read them over and over. So one way of avoiding that Rereading Amarpreet is to break down your sentence into small parts, understand that small part, and then move ahead. Pooja found it of medium difficulty level. Great. All right. So let me uh, check out, guys. Quickly, let me explain this to you. Hmm. Here goes my explanation. So I'm going to use the first, I'm going to analyze the stimulus properly, and then I'm going to use the uh, causality framework. So 50 years ago, we are told that crocodiles were brought to the waters. When we say brought to the waters, it means they weren't found there originally. They were brought there. Okay. So this premise provides a factual piece of information. All right. Next, excessive predation by the huge crocodile population now. So we are talking about the current situation. Okay. Current situation, there is a lot of hunting being done by the crocodile population, which has grown huge probably. And because of, so the crocodiles are now found in huge numbers. They are preying excessively. They are eating the mena fish in huge numbers. Mena is the only source of omega-3, which is an essential fatty acid for the fauna people. Okay. So we can make the inference that the local people are facing a shortage in their only supply of omega-3. So see how I have simplified this information here. That single sentence, that one sentence there has so many small pieces of information. Everybody noticed. And if you read the sentence too fast, you will miss out the information. Okay. Let's continue. The county officials plan to reduce. So they have a plan here. They want to reduce the crocodile population. Okay. <clears throat> and how do they plan to do it? By introducing another fish called runa. It contains a highly poisonous chemical. But this chemical is poisonous only to crocodiles, not to humans. So they can easily introduce runa in the water. And the runa will kill the crocodile. But the humans will not die because of runa. All right. However, there is a possibility. So there is a drawback here to the plan. Already the author is mentioning a drawback. The runa will harm the small native lizards that live in the water. So there is a possibility that the small lizards that are native to that water, they can be harmed by this runa. The crocodile will definitely be harmed. The runa might also harm small native lizards. The officials... So the however presents a contrast, the plan is a drawback, the runa might cause harm to small native lizards. The officials plan therefore, now there is a therefore here, 
may be good for the county people but will increase the threat to native aquatic life now there are two parts to the conclusion here okay my question is uh one is the plan to introduce tuna fish is poisonous for crocodiles one effect is good for the county people how probably the omega 3 supply will no longer be threatened the other effect is the threat to native aquatic life will increase okay what is the main intention of the author guys the first effect or the second effect what is the main conclusion effect 1 or effect 2 quickly what is the main conclusion Neha says effect 1 is the main conclusion each of you ask yourself is the author trying to tell you that the plan is going to be good for the county people or is the author really trying to tell you the plan is going to be bad for the native aquatic life what is the main conclusion so rajavi aditya please ask yourself is the main purpose to tell you that the plan is going to be good for the county people if that is the main purpose i'll repeat this aditya neha kumari rajavi all right if the conclusion was the first part then the author will not write the second part okay if the conclusion is the first part the author will not write the second part because the author wants to tell you that the second part is there that is why the author is writing so the main uh, the main issue that we are going to address is the plan will increase the threat to the native aquatic life we are not even saying it will threaten the aquatic life it will increase the threat concentrate on that so let's apply the framework cause is the plan effect is increase the threat so plan to introduce the runa fish effect will increase the threat to native aquatic life and the small lizard is one example of that not native aquatic life what was our first guideline x happened before y now this is not applicable in this case because the plan has not been put into action so we don't need to say what happened before what guideline number 2 no alternate cause can lead to the stated effect now that means what is the stated effect increase the stated effect of pay attention guys what is the stated effect the stated effect is increase in the increase the threat to native aquatic life right so we are saying basically the author assumes that nothing else can cause an increase in the threat to the native aquatic life right which means assumption one is nothing else poses a bigger threat poses a bigger threat means nothing else can increase threat right so nothing else poses a bigger threat to the native aquatic life than the introduction of the poisonous runa poisonous runa is the biggest threat all right for example what if the native aquatic life is facing a bigger threat than the one from runa what if the small lizards are also being eaten by crocodile in that case by introducing the runa and by killing the crocodiles the native aquatic life will be saved the threat will be reduced and the conclusion will break down so we are saying that this is not happening this is not the bigger threat okay the moment we say nothing else can cause an increase in the threat what are the current threats the crocodile is already preying so we are assuming that the crocodile is not preying on the native lizards because if the crocodiles are preying on the native lizards then by killing crocodiles we will be reducing the threat to native lizard not increasing so that is one assumption no reverse causality the author is also assuming that the small lizard will not cause any harm to the runa fish 
if the small lizards can harm the runa the conclusion will break down so those are the two assumptions that we have here guys is it clear in fact let me just take you back to the no alternate thread yeah. is this clear guys take a moment to absorb this see how i applied the framework all of you and so easy it was i just had to use the guidelines i just had to write down my possible answer choices using the uh, the cause and the effect take 30 seconds to understand it are we clear absolutely <clears throat> are we clear guys great so by now i'm sure all of you have realized those of you who are not clear please ask your question i'll answer now some of you are saying you're not clear take a moment Yes, Anubhav, you will get the PDF of this webinar. Yes, guys, what um, are there any queries on this question? I don't see any question, but if you have any doubts, please ask them now. All right, I guess everybody's understood this. so let's move to the answer choice elimination a says officials have not been able to come up with an alternate plan now remember this is an assumption does it have to be true that officials were not able to come up with an alternate plan it is possible that they came up with an alternative plan now alternative plan is not the same as alternate cause alternate plan is some other plan b it's not the same as alternate cause okay so don't be confused 35% of you marked a i think you marked it because of that confusion we are saying that officials were not able to come up with some other plan to reduce crocodile population okay but does that tell me that the this plan plan of uh, poisoning the crocodiles it will uh, increase the threat to native aquatic life no Yeah, this has absolutely no impact on the conclusion on being negated if you say the officials have not been have been able to come up with an alternate plan even if they have been able to come up with an alternative plan it is possible that they don't want to use that plan they want to first use this plan so this is absolutely out of scope our scope is by this plan to poison the crocodiles will it increase the threat to native aquatic life i need an answer choice which says yes it will increase so this choice does not tell me that poisoning the crocodiles will increase the threat to native life or not controlled experiments have proved the ability of runa to bring down the crocodile population by a significant percentage this this supports the success of the plan yes but it is not a necessary condition even if experiments have not been carried out even if controlled experiments have not proved the ability it is possible that by introducing the runa which does contain a chemical highly poisonous to crocodiles we might still be able to pull off the plan so b is also out it's a strainer but it is definitely not an assumption in fact this just talks about the success of plan it is a strainer for success of plan but it is definitely not telling me the assumption behind increase in threat so b is out c 
the runa fish often prey on the eggs of small lizards so this is we already know that there is a possibility that runa will harm the small native lizards how it will increase the threat we don't know okay so this is no new piece of information because we already know that runa may cause harm how it causes harm is not important what we need to understand is the introduction of runa will increase the threat so this talks about the present threat not about increasing the threat so c is also distortion and half truth trap b the crocodiles currently do not face the predation of, from any animals c the issue is not about crocodiles being predation, uh, predated in fact let's say we don't know whether the crocodile is being preyed upon by land animals or water animals if some land animals eat crocodiles then by killing crocodiles we will be harming the wildlife okay so this will not have any impact on the conclusion but if some predators are aquatic animal then by killing crocodiles we are reducing the food of the predators then we might actually be uh, harming the native aquatic life in that case it will strengthen but this is definitely not an assumption therefore so d is also out of scope nobody mark d the correct answer is e for native lizard population excessive predation by crocodiles is not the most significant current threat okay because if crocodiles were the significant threat then we can't say that by killing crocodiles we are increasing the threat then by killing the crocodiles we would be decreasing the threat so we are saying that predation by crocodile is not a bigger threat right now and therefore e is the correct answer so anubhav an assumption question asks for what has to be true the passage does not say that we got to know about the poison after the experiment the passage is saying that we already know that runa contains a chemical which is poisonous all right experiments may or may not prove it all right experiments the the choice says experiment was able to show that the runa can kill crocodiles in huge numbers it doesn't have to be true let's say an experiment was conducted and the runa did not kill crocodile in huge numbers but when the when the runa was actually introduced in fauna county it was perhaps possible to kill the crocodiles then so it's not a must be true condition all right anubhav so swapnil is the conclusion breakdown clear to you if the crocodiles are the most significant threat okay let's negate the conclusion let's negate the conclusion that crocodile is the most significant threat to the native aquatic life then by killing the crocodile we are reducing the threat so the conclusion breaks all right swapnil so guys that brings us to the end of this session three most powerful strategies the power of analyzing the stimulus correctly the power of defining the scope of the argument and the power of using frameworks out of which i have just shown you one okay i have earlier shared with you the link to the free trial version of our course if you want you can uh try it out i have already posted as a sticky message right at the top of the chat box uh the link to uh setting up a call with our strategy expert that's a free of cost call all right and finally a third uh, announcement again to make is that tomorrow we are starting off the crash course okay we are starting a crash course tomorrow uh, the class will be held the first of the class that is the verbal i'll be taking that session will be held at 7 pm ist and 130 pm gmt so those of you who are interested you can uh, kind of uh, uh, visit our website and check out the uh, link check out the registration for the crash course you will be getting the details about the price and all the other details what else you are going to get with the crash course in that um, uh, on the website itself all right
Any questions you have, guys, so far? Any queries related to your preparation or anything? I'm there for the next few minutes. And I hope uh, this session helped you. Some of you were not able to um, rate the session. So I hope it, you found it helpful. And if you could just rate the session and any other feedback that you can give us. Anubhav, I am just uploading the PDF. Give me a moment. So I'm sharing the PDF with you guys. The three strategies might look a little stretched to you, but that is because you're not used to it. Just remember to use them, especially the one related to analyzing the stimulus properly and defining the scope. Those two you can use anywhere on any question and you will get cent for cent results. That's for sure. So Chiranjeev, uh, make sure that you, in fact, whether it's SC, CR or RC, I would say go for the meaning. When you're reading these sentences, like when you were reading the stimulus, when you were reading uh, uh, the answer choices, understand in your own simplified manner what the stimulus is saying, what the answer choice is saying. That way you will be able to understand the scenario. That way you will be able to uh, notice the logical gaps that you will be able to eliminate the incorrect choices. So my suggestion is read by breaking the sentence into small portions by understanding the meaning of those portions. Any other query you have, guys, I'll be glad to answer those queries for you. Any feedback that you feel about the session? Uh, whether it was helpful or not, or whether it was not of any help, anything, any feedback that can help us give you a better experience. So we have these uh, free webinars every Friday. Um, sometimes they are on verbal and sometimes they are on quant. They are also on strategy. Yes, Swapnil. In fact, uh, in our course, we first take the students uh, through SC, uh, where we teach a student how to read a sentence, then CR, and then after CR, we ask you to apply the strategy to RC. So you can definitely apply it to RCs. You're welcome, Mahima. Um, glad that you found the session helpful. Do use it. Do use the techniques that we've learned today. Okay, slowly and steadily. Initially, it will take you some time, but gradually you will find a lot of improvement being made. So any other queries you have, guys, related to your prep? All of you are most welcome. Thank you for being such an interactive audience, guys. And um, all the best for your preparation for GMAT and GRE, as the case may be. Um, all the best, Chiranjeev. Uh, hope you do really well in your exam. So once again, guys, if you want to talk to our strategy expert, you can book a call on Calendly.com. You can try out the free trial version of our course. And once again, telling you, we are launching a crash course tomorrow, which comprises access to both verbal and quant courses, online courses, the question bank, uh, plus, we will also be giving you 25 live sessions. The verbal sessions will be taken by me and the quant sessions will be taken by our quant expert. Thank you so much, Annie, for that lovely, lovely compliment. Oh, Annie, so sorry for that. Um, if you missed the SC section for your batch, Maybe you can talk to Piyush about uh, whether you can do a makeup of that. So, Annie, let me share with you my number just a minute. If you want, you can just connect. Oh, 
All right, guys, I don't see any other questions coming up. So once again, let me wish all of you a good day if you're just starting your day and a good night if it is the end of the day. See you guys around soon. You're welcome, NG. Uh, I hope all of you all have benefited and continue to benefit. So bidding you uh, by prompt, Chimatwiz, good, good day and good night. Thank you.